Hi, this is Tammy McClish. Let's go ahead and take a look at Section 6, Film Screen Image Receptors. Now, when we're talking about radiographic film, it's not too different from photographic film. The image you're seeing on your right is photographic film. On the one side, it's very shiny. On the other side, it's very dull. And that will determine if we're looking at the emulsion side or the non-emulsion side. So radiographic and photographic film have two parts. They have a base and they have an emulsion. The base is the foundation of radiographic film that provides a rigid structure onto which the emulsion can be coated. The emulsion is what gives the actual film the dull appearance. So if you're looking at the picture on the right, the picture that looks more like a pinkish purple, that is the emulsion side. The part that looks black, kind of shiny, that is the base side. That is the non-emulsion side. So sometimes you can have a film that only has emulsion coated on the one side. Now the picture that you're seeing on the left shows a base with an adhesive and on both sides of the adhesive, we have emulsion. So that is a double emulsion system. Now there's also a super coat over the emulsion so that we do not scratch the emulsion. Now, originally the film base was glass. We use glass plates prior to the world wars. And after that, it was difficult for the um, people that were taking the images to carry those glass plates. So the glass plates were replaced by cellulose nitrate, but we found out that was flammable. And that was replaced by cellulose triacetate, which is known as a safety base. And as early as the 1960s, we started using a base that is polyester. So if we're talking about film, we're talking about a polyester base. The definition for film emulsion a material with which X-rays or light photons from screens interact and transfer information. So what's interesting about film is that it interacts with light in order to produce the image. Now, if you go for a dental X-ray, dental X-rays do not have screens inside of them. Therefore, 100% of the radiation provides the exposure on the film, but with radiographic film, we have intensifying screens inside the cassettes, which means that 99% of the image is produced because of the light that interacts with the intensifying screens. Where if you had a dental x-ray that does not have an intensifying screen, 100% of the radiation will make the exposure. So the emulsion is a mixture of gelatin and silver halide crystals. The principal function of gelatin is to provide mechanical support for the silver halide crystals by holding them uniformly dispersed in place. So in order to make an x-ray image, you have to have a cassette. Now, if we're talking about a digital cassette, we're usually calling it an IR, an image receptor. So let's take a look at these cassettes. These are all pictures of cassettes, and these are rigid holders that contain film and screen. Now the one all the way to the right, which is yellow and green, those are cassettes that we're used to seeing when we're taking x-rays. Those are film screen combinations. So a lot of time you're going to hear us say film screen combination. That means we have a cassette, and inside that cassette, we have screens, we either have one or two intensifying screens, and then we have a film inside, and that film is either coated with emulsion on one side or coated with emulsion on both sides. Now, if you have emulsion coated on both sides, then you have to have screens on both sides of your cassette. Now, the image you're seeing in the middle, the orange image, that is a CR cassette or CR image receptor. That is computerized radiography. And the one you're seeing all the way to the right is digital radiography. That is an IR, an image receptor. 
when you're talking about taking images on film, we talk about the speed of the system. Speed is the sensitivity of this film screen combination. It's the screen film combination to x-rays and light. Speed is reported as the speed of the film and radiographic intensifying screens. If you have a slow speed system, it's going to be about 50. If you have a high speed system, it's going to be about 1200. So I need you to think back to the time when you went out and you actually purchased film for your photographic camera. If you picked a slowed speed film, which you probably picked a hundred speed film, that was something that you would take pictures of somebody that was just sitting for a portrait. Where if you were taking pictures of somebody that was in an athletic event, you would probably purchase a 400 speed film, which would be a faster film. So think about it that way. 100 speed films are slow and 400 speed films are very fast. It's no different than when we were taking x-rays on film screen. So if I were to take an x-ray of a hand, I knew that that hand would not move. And because that hand does not move, I'm going to use a 100 speed system. The reason I use a 100 speed system is because I want good detail. So we actually called our extremity cassettes, which were pictures of our hands and our feet, our arms and our legs, we actually called those extremity cassettes or detail cassettes. So the cassette that you see that is yellow with a, um, with a gray around it, that was an extremity cassette. So that would probably be a 100 speed system. So I knew that if I was gonna take a hand x-ray or a foot x-ray, I would grab that cassette because that was called a detail cassette. It would give me nice detail and the system would, was gonna be slow, but it would give me nice detail. If I was gonna x-ray a skull or a spine, like a cervical spine, I would grab the green cassette because that was a 400 speed system. That was a faster speed system and that would allow me to have not really good detail. However, it would allow in case the patient moved. And if you go to x-ray a cervical spine, patients might move. So we would select a higher speed system. So that's how I knew how to take x-rays. I would grab the slow speeds for my extremities and the higher speeds for um, my spine work or my skull work. So think about a patient, think about their axial skeleton. Their axial skeleton is their cranium and their spine. You would use a 400 speed system. And if we were x-raying arms and legs, extremities, which are our appendicular skeleton, we would grab the 100 speed system. Slow speed for detail, high speed if there's a potential for motion. That is film screen combination. So let's take a look at the cassette in the middle. The cassette in the middle is a computerized radiography cassette. Now, what does that mean? Well, when I was using that cassette, you see the little picture on the front of the little body part? I would circle or write the body part that I was x-raying. Because I, when I went to, not the processor, but when I went to the digitizer, I had to tell the digitizer what type of an x-ray I had just taken on the patient because I had one cassette. I had one cassette to x-ray the entire body. So I would have to say to it, okay, machine, I am now giving you a hand x-ray. So the machine would say, okay, then I'm going to run it at a 100 speed system. Or I would say, okay, machine, I'm giving you a skull x-ray or a spine x-ray. And it would say, all right, now I have a 400 speed system. So it would change the speed based upon the body part that I was telling the computerized radiography system what I was x-raying. Now, the, all the way to the right, that is the digital cassette. The black cassette, that's the digital cassette. Same cassette I would use on everybody, and that's called an image receptor. And what I would do is I would select hand x-ray and I would tell the machine, this is gonna be a hand x-ray. And it would change the speed of the system 
based upon what I was telling the machine that I was going to take an x-ray of next. So that's how we worked with the different speeds of the system. So the slower the speed, you're going to have nice detail. The higher the speed, you're not going to have so nice detail. So if I was working in orthopedics and I had a linebacker coming in with really big shoulders, I would use a 1200 speed system because I knew that I had to penetrate that shoulder. I didn't worry about detail. I just wanted to make sure that I was able to take an x-ray. So high speed systems, 1200 speed systems, you would use on really large patients. Here are two terms you're gonna to need to know when you go to take your credentialing test, latent and manifest. Latent image is the unobservable image stored in the silver halide emulsion. It is made manifest by processing. So if I take an x-ray on a film screen combination and I walk into the dark room and I'm in the dark and I'm taking my um, piece of film out of the cassette and I'm going to process it, that image is, is latent. It has not been processed yet. Once I put it through the x-ray processor, I have a manifest image, which is the observable image that is formed when the latent image undergoes proper chemical processing. Now that's no different in CR, in computerized radiography. When I take an x-ray, that latent image is stored inside the cassette until I can walk it over to a digitizer, put it in the digitizer, and then the digitizer gives me an image on my computer monitor that's manifest. Now for digital imaging, it happens instantaneously. It goes latent and manifest very quickly, invisible to visible. Optical density is the blackness on a radiograph. Now, an x-ray is either very dense or it's not very dense. It's very white or it's very black. You also have shades of gray in between. When we talk about the shades of gray in between, that's more contrast. But density is the degree of blackening of a radiograph. Detail or spatial resolution. Detail is the sharpness of an image. It is the sharpness of structural lines on a radiograph. As I was telling you earlier, I wanted nice detail when I was x-raying fingers, so I would grab what we called a detail cassette because I knew I would have nice detail. Spatial resolution is the ability, ability to image small objects that have very high subject contrast. So if I'm looking at the chest x-ray, I can see the structures of the air as it co is coming down through the trachea to the bifurcation at the, at the carina going to the right and left lung. I'm able to see very small objects with very high subject contrast. Subject contrast is the degree of difference between the blacks and whites. So I'm seeing the air coming down the air-filled trachea and I'm seeing the whiteness of the mediastinum. Contrast resolution is the ability to distinguish between and to image similar tissue. So in the first x-ray you're seeing, you're seeing that a patient has some patchiness in the left lung. That is a pneumonia. I can see that because my image allows me to see lots of shades of gray. Where the image with the arrow, that is a picture of somebody that has a collapsed lung. The right lung is showing that it is totally collapsed and the lung is actually pushed toward the mediastinum. That is giving me a high contrast x-ray, lots of black and lots of white versus the first x-ray that has the left marker on that, that is a low contrast x-ray. I'm able to see lots and lots of shades of gray. I'm able to see the pneumonia in the left lung. 
and I'm also able to see the chest tube that is placed down into the patient's right side of their chest. So that is contrast resolution. Spectrum matching. When I first started in x-ray school in the early 1980s, we used film that was placed into a cassette and that cassette had screens inside of them that emitted a blue violet light. Therefore, we needed to place a film inside of that cassette that was spectrally matched. So spectral matching is use of rare earth screens only in conjunction with film emulsions that have light absorption characteristic matched to the light emission of the screen. So the cassettes we had back in the early 1980s emitted a blue violet light, which is very low intensity, but we had to put a film inside of it that matched that light. Once we bought cassettes that emitted a brighter yellow green light, we couldn't use that film anymore. If we put that film in there, it was not spectrally matched, which meant we needed to expose the patients to more radiations and the pictures were not pretty. So we then had to scrap that film and buy film that worked with a yellow green emitting intensifying screen. So that's called spectrum matching. You need to make sure that the light that is coming off of your screens matches the film that you're placing inside those cassettes. We needed to also make sure that we put our film in a nice place where that it would not be exposed to radiation or to light. Improper handling and storage result in poor radiographs with artifacts that interfere with diagnosis. You need to make sure your hands are clean and dry before you touch the film when you're in the dark room. So you don't want to have wet lotiony hands. You do not want to bend the film when you're in the dark room. You want to store the film in a cool dry place at temperatures lower than 20 degrees Celsius, which is 68 degrees Fahrenheit. And you want to store at 60, less than 60% humidity. You also want to protect the cassettes from the radiation in the x-ray room. You never want to store your cassettes with film inside the x-ray room. You want to put it outside the x-ray room so that you do not expose those cassettes to unintended radiation from your x-ray machine. Now, when we were shooting film that had um, film screen combinations, we also need to make sure that we worried about fog. Fog is unintended optical density on a radiograph that reduces contrast through light or chemical contamination. Now, in the very first x-ray, we're seeing fog. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to draw around the fog. This is fog right here. So what had happened was this cassette was broke and there was a hinge right here and a hinge right here. Well, this hinge was broke. And so when we thought we closed the cassette, we did not. So all of this black you're seeing here, that was from light that leaked in because of the fact that the cassette was kind of broke. Okay, so that's one thing we worry about. We worry about cassettes that are broke, which cause light to fog in. The second cassette is really interesting. I was working at a hospital, and the one day when I was there, I took this x-ray of this patient, which is a lateral thoracic spine, and then I left that cassette sitting in the room because I wasn't paying attention, and have you ever seen, um, yeah, it's probably around like that, a footstool in an x-ray room? Well, here's the footstool. And you can actually see this bar going through the patient's x-ray. And that's because of the fact that I left that cassette in the room 
And when I went to take my next x-ray, the bar showed up. So that's not good. But it was great because I got to show you. Here's another thing we did in mammography. We would take a phantom and we would put it in the dark room. And then we would turn on the safe light for five minutes. And then we would turn the safe light off and we would run the image through the processor. Now, on the one side of this phantom, we would put a piece of cardboard over it. And that cardboard contained the word fog. You can see it below too. So, this showed me that after five minutes of me being in the dark room, with my safe light on, I was gonna fog my image. That's okay, because if I'm gonna be in the dark room for more than five minutes, then I'm not doing a good job. But this shows you fog on an image that was left in the dark room for over five minutes with the safe light on. Sometimes high temperatures or heat can cause a problem with your x-ray film. So x-ray film is sensitive to high temperatures and heat will increase the fog and reduce the contrast. Sometimes we would actually take our cassettes and we would walk them in the dark room and we would just put them on top of the x-ray processor and it'd be really hot up there. And then we would go ahead and we would process it and they would have fog on them. I don't actually have a picture of that. But that's what would happen. The middle picture is my pride and joy. I was working at a hospital and we had a brand new cassette that arrived and instead of cleaning it like we were supposed to, somebody just went ahead and put a piece of film inside of it. If there is static on a cassette and you place a film inside the cassette, you are going to put static on the film. This is called lightning rod static. Radiographic film is sensitive to high humidity. Static increases when humidity drops below 40%. So all of this stuff here that looks like lightning rod branches, that is static electricity. The second we put that film inside that cassette, it just pulled the electricity to the film and when we x-rayed the patient, that's what her x-ray looked like. The last picture is light fog. Light can expose the emulsion before processing and film fog or produce an artifact on the film. Film should be placed in the film bin that is in a light, tight, dark room. Well, back in the day, we would put our film into the processor. We'd put it inside the processor over here on this side. So we'd put the film in the processor and it would go through the processor and we would pop out of this bin. Well, you had about 15 seconds to wait to hear a bell. Well, the one day I wasn't waiting to hear the bell and this much of the film went into the processor, which was a lateral L5S1 spine X-ray. This part was exposed to the light because the bell didn't ring yet. I opened the door and all of this turned black because I wasn't paying attention and I was in a hurry to get out of the dark room. So that's what happens. Radiation fog, artifact caused by unintentional exposure to radiation. Ionizing radiation other than the useful beam creates an image artifact by increasing fog and reducing contrast. Now an x-ray film is more sensitive to radiation than people. So after we take an x-ray on a film with the patient's lumbar and we walk away, scatter radiation coming in contact with an exposed film will create an image artifact by producing contrast and increasing fog. This is another one of my favorite images. I was working with a gentleman 
and he had long arms and he took this x-ray. You can see his watch and you can see his arm. And here's his hand. Well, that's not his hand, but you know what I'm saying. Well, what happened was he had this in his arm and then he leaned into the room to tell the patient to hold their breath and he took the x-ray. And you can see his arm and you can see his watch. So that's why you don't wanna do that. Shelf life or age fog. You need to check the expiration date of your film often. Shelf life of 45 days is reasonable and it's the maximum amount of time for the film. After that, you should go to a new box of film. So you wanna make sure you go through a whole box before you open a new. You need to do that within 45 days. Pressure artifacts are marks that sometimes appear on the process radiograph. You should have several cassettes and you should rotate the cassettes. If you do not rotate the cassettes, then what will happen is air will stay in the cassette and it will not leak out. So this picture here is actually a mammogram cassette. And we put a mesh on top and then we compressed it. All these little dots you're seeing, those are all from trapped air inside the cassette. So you should wait a couple minutes before you use that cassette to let that air come out of that cassette. So we did that, we waited a little bit longer. We tried the compression test and the longer we waited, we had less air trapped in the cassette. So that's what it looks like if you don't wait and cycle through your cassettes. You really need to do that. Now let's talk about intensifying screens. So if you open up a cassette, if it is a dual screen cassette, you will see white layers on each side of the cassette. Now inside a, a intensifying screen, you have the protective layer, you have the phosphor layer that emits light, you have a reflective layer and you have the base. And right now the base that we use is called polyester. The screen phosphor, the phosphor is a rare earth phosphor, which is the active layer of the screen. The phosphor emits light during stimulation by x-ray. The intensifying screens use a rare earth phosphor that is a fluorescent material that emits light photons within 10 to the negative eighth seconds after stimulation by x-rays. These phosphors are converted to a latent image on the film using silver halide crystals on the film as a storage medium. Those phosphors fluoresce and then they stop. So 99% of your image is due to the light coming off the intensifying screen and not the actual radiation itself. We are using a lot less radiation now than we ever did because the light is what exposes the film. Now, your screen should fluoresce and then stop. So fluorescence is the emission of visible light only during stimulation. Once the stimulation stops, it should stop fluorescing. Think of a glow stick. A glow stick is something you do not want. You want it to fluoresce and then stop. If it keeps fluorescing, then you're going to overexpose your image. The reason we use intensifying screens is because of dose reduction. The one x-ray you are seeing without screens and the other you are seeing with screens. Intensifying screens convert the energy of the x-ray beam into visible light. This visible light then interacts with the film to form the latent image. Approximately 30% of the light striking a screen interacts with the screen. The use of screens results in lower patient dose, but has the disadvantage of causing a slight blurring of the image. 
the blur is not that serious. We have different types of resolution of cassettes. You see two cassettes here. One cassette has single emulsion, which means it has, excuse me, is a single intensifying screen cassette, which means that the emulsion or the dull side would go toward the screen. The non-emulsion side would go through the black part. The second cassette you're seeing is a dual screen cassette, which means that you have a film that has emulsion on both sides, so both sides look dull. There's a term called less resolution, which is the lack ability to image two separate objects and visibly detect one from another. When we were not using screens, we did not have nice resolution. We needed more resolution, so we had to go to screens in order to do so. So when we had dark rooms, we had to maintain the dark room. We also had to clean the cassettes. Cleaning it is a busy part, clean, cleaning in a busy department, it may be necessary to clean screens once a month or more often. We clean the screens with the manufacturer preferred cleaner and allow the screens to air dry. You could not take a different manufacturer's cleaner and use it on all cassettes. If you did, you could ruin the screen. Screen film test, which I told you about earlier, was a wire mesh test placed on the cassette and we x-rayed the cassettes. If there was a blur, it meant there was poor screen film contact and the cassette needed to be replaced. And I also told you about spectral matching, which is use of a rear earth screen in conjunction with film emulsion that have light absorption characteristic matched to the light emission of the screen. You couldn't put the wrong film in the wrong cassette. Automatic processors are called wet film processing. Developer is a chemical, usually phenidone, hydroquinone, or metal, that reduces exposed silver ions to atomic silver. So when we take that film and we put it in a processor, that developer is the chemical that is going to break down the silver ions and it's going to change them to atomic silver. It produces a visible image from the latent image. Now back in the day, we used to have what was called manual film processing, where we would take a film and we would dunk it in a tank for five minutes, five minutes in the developer. These automatic processors, 22 seconds, just 22 seconds in the developer. The developer looks like urine. If the developer looks like Coca-Cola, that means that it is oxidized. That means that it is broken down, it's old, you need to get rid of it. So there was a floating top that we put inside of this tank to keep the oxygen away from the developer. Inside the developer, there are different agents. The developing agents are phenidone, and hydroquinone. The phenidone is the reducer that gives you your grays, and the hydroquinone is your reducer that gives you the, the black tones. The activator is sodium carbonate, which helps swell the gelatin of the um, film. It produces alkalinity and controls the pH. The restrainer is potassium bromide. It is an anti-fog agent which protects unexposed crystals from chemical attack. Otherwise, the film would be 100% black. So we gotta restrain the developer. The preservative is sodium sulfite, which controls the oxidation and maintains the balance among the developer components. Remember, if developer is oxidized, it looks like Coca-Cola. It's as old as can be because oxygen hit it. The hardener is glutarodehydride, dehyde, can't even say that. 
It controls the swell of the emulsion and enhances the archival quality so that your image looks good for years and years. The sequestering agent is called chelates, which remove metallic impurities and stabilizes the developing agent. And then there's a solvent in there. It's water and it dissolves the chemicals for use. So that's all part of the developer. Now the fixer looks like water. If you have old fixer, it's going to look like water with um, snow inside of it. If you see snow inside your fixer, like little crystals, it's old. Fixer re removes the remaining silver halide from the emulsion and it hardens the gel. Now back in the day, we put our film in the manual processor in the fixer for 15 minutes. It was awful. Now with the automated processors, 22 seconds in the automated processor. Now, you cannot take that film and put it back in the developer. If you do that, you're gonna ruin the developer. You could put a little bit of developer in the fixer, but you cannot put any fixer in the developer. You put a drop of fixer in the developer, you ruin it. That's why we go developer to fixer. In the fixer, we have the activator, which is acetic acid, and you can smell it when you're in the dark room. It smells to high heaven, it's awful. It neutralizes the developer and stops its action. The fixing agent, another thing that you smell, ammonium theosulfate, smells awful. It removes the undeveloped silver bromide from the emulsion. The, hard on, the hardener is potassium alum, which stiffens and, strength, and shrinks the emulsion. The preservative is sodium sulfite, which maintains the chemical balance. The buffer is acetate, you know, the stuff we use on our nails and it maintains the proper pH. The sequestering agent is boric acid and salts. It removes the silver ions. And the solvent is water. It dissolves the other components. You couldn't breathe in the um, dark room. It just smelled so bad. Okay, so the film goes from, <coughs> excuse me, developer to fixer. Now, if you are doing manual development by hand, you go developer, rinse, and then fixer. But in the automatic processor, you didn't need to rinse because the film went through um, some rollers that squeezed the excess developer out before it went to the fixer. Then it goes to the wash. So what we did was we put our film into the processor. Now what you would do is you would take the film and you would push it all the way to one side or another. And you would push it into the processor. The very first place it went was through the developer. The next place it went was through the fixer. The next place it went was through the wash. And the next place it went was through the dryer. And all of these nib knobs here, that's the transport system that takes and moves that film through there, okay? So, let me erase here. The wash removes the excess chemicals. Now, back in the day when we had manual systems, we had to wash our film for 20 minutes. Automatic 20 seconds, 20 seconds in the automatic processor. The dryer removes the water and prepares radiographic film for viewing. 30 minutes for automatic process, excuse me, for manual processing. 30 minutes, it was awful. Have you ever heard of a wet reading? A wet reading means that the doctor is tired of waiting and he says, open the door, let me look and he looks at the picture wet. That's called a wet reading. We only gave it to him when it started in the dryer, in the, excuse me, when we started in the washer and went to the dryer. Automatic processing the dryer is only 26 seconds. 
Now, believe it or not, I was on a medical mission in Honduras back in the 1990s, and we actually hand developed x-rays. This is so funny. You would then take the x-rays and you would hang them on a clothesline out in the um, open air area, like over the grass in the courtyard. And if the doctor wanted to look at a patient's x-ray, he would roam out there and look for his patient's x-ray. Believe it or not, that was before HIPAA. That's the way we used to do it. It was crazy insane, but we did it. And then the transport, this system um, begins at the feed tray where the entrance rollers grip the film to begin the trip through the processor. Entrance rollers grip the film and a micro switch is engaged to control the replenishment rate of the chemicals. The chemicals are underneath the processor and however much film you put in, it replenishes. Now, if you had films that were coming out really, really dark, you would check the timing on your processor. So if you knew that you had a um, 90 second processor, you'd put your film in, you'd start the timer. If your film did come out, not come out in 90 seconds, you knew it was getting stuck in the processor. And if it was too dark, it was probably getting stuck in the developer. So that's how we had to do things back in caveman time. We also had to check the temperature. Now remember, I told you before, this very first one you're seeing, the red, that is the developer. We would check the temperature of the developer. The developer needs to be 35 degrees Celsius or 95 degrees Fahrenheit. If I took the wash water temperature, it needs to be three degrees Celsius or five degrees Fahrenheit lower than the developer. When I was in my medical mission in Honduras, we checked the temperature of the developer and it said 35 and we said, oh, what does that mean? We then had to go find a thermometer because none of us could remember how to change Celsius to Fahrenheit. So it's important if you need to know that to know that because you never know when you're gonna to have to use it. In the automatic processor, there's a circulator. A circulation system continuously pumps the developer and the fixer, thus maintaining constant agitation within each tank. Water must be circulated throughout the wash tank to remove all the processing chemicals from the surface of the film before it hits the dryer. And then replenishment. Underneath your um, processor are your replenishment tanks. Replacement of the developer and fixer in the automatic processing and film. The replenishment system meters the proper quantity of chemicals into each tank to maintain volume and chemical activity. Replenishment of the developer is more important than fixer, but the fixer has to be replenished too. You're gonna to use more developer than fixer. Safe light. In your dark room, you have incandescent lamps with a color filter that provides sufficient illumination in the dark room while ensuring that the film remains unexposed. This is something you probably need to know. A 15 watt bulb should be no closer than 1.5 meters or five feet from the work surface. If it's any closer, it can fog your film. Now, back in the days when I went to school, we had blue sensitive film. So we did not have a red filter, we had an amber filter. But eventually, for blue and green film, a red filter is used. Okay, so red filter is for blue and green sensitive film. But if you just have blue sensitive film, you have to use an amber filter. We were working with chemicals. We needed to be safe. So there are safety data sheets. Now this one says a material safety data sheet. I wanted to show you that because at some point they drop the word material and they're just called safety data sheets, SDS. 
a document listing the name and manufacturer of the chemicals. It also gives you the hazardous parts of the chemicals and what to do if you were exposed to the chemical. In the darkroom, you need to have a emergency eye wash station. You need to wear goggles and apron and gloves when you pour chemicals for safety. We also needed to provide maintenance to the processors. Scheduled maintenance was routine procedures that are performed weekly or monthly, such as taking these rollers out. They were called crossover rollers, and we would rinse them and clean them real good. Preventative maintenance was planned maintenance on the parts at regular intervals. So we would have a service guy come out and they would replace all the movable parts inside the system because we didn't want to have non-scheduled maintenance, which meant something broke and it required a repair. Daily monitoring. Temperature of the developer and wash should be noted daily. This needs to be written down somewhere. Developer and fixer replenishments rates should be reserved and recorded, observed and recorded, and the replenishment tanks should be checked to make sure floating lids are properly positioned. Sensitometry. We would actually expose a sensitometry strip. We would run it through the processor, and then we would check for fog, we would check the speed and the contrast, and we would record that daily. But that was something we just did in mammography. However, back in the 1980s in the hospital, we had somebody that would do this daily before the, before the department opened. But with mammography, you have to do this every time before you actually start a procedure. Now, this picture here is a densitometer. The densitometer is sending a light through the sensitometry strip. If 100% of the light goes through, it's assigned a density value of zero. If 10% light can go through, the density value is one. So the less light that goes through, the higher the number. A perfect X-ray will have a density value of 1.5. So if I were x-raying a lumbar spine, and here's my patient, and I have one, two, three, four, five lumbar tebral bodies going down into my pelvis and my sacrum, I would go ahead and check here, right in the middle of my third lumbar vertebral body. And that density better be 1.5. If it wasn't, then I knew my film was too dark or too light. And that's how we knew if we had a good film. We would have the person that was in charge of quality control doing this periodically through the day. And that's how we knew we had nice x-rays. All right, have a good day.